Radiation can be incredibly damaging. Ionizing radiation has the ability to break chemical bonds, damage DNA, and severely impact cells. These affected cells may die or become cancerous, ultimately leading to severe complications. But what if this same powerful radiation could be used for good? What if instead of harming, it could help by mutating and modifying cells to produce a positive outcome? Not to create superheroes, but to make our food grow faster, taste better, and become more nutritious. This is exactly what researchers hoped to explore post-World War II as more applications to nuclear sciences were being discovered. And while a radiating food seems like it would be something relegated to a time when people were trying to put nuclear reactors in their cars, the research would lay the framework for practices that we still use on our food to this day. So dish up a plate as we learn something new. This is the fourth video in my Atoms for Peace series. While each of the videos can be watched without all of the information contained in the others, I highly recommend going back after and viewing the other three. But while this video is about the Atoms for Peace movement, it's more specifically about a sub-movement called Atoms for Agriculture. But to understand why we would want to flood our crops with radiation, we first have to go back to Gregor Mendel. You may have heard about Mendel's peas back in your middle school biology class. In 1865, he learned about inherited traits by studying pea plants, carefully pollinating the plants and saving seeds to analyze future generations. He found that traits like the color and texture of the peas could be passed down and would eventually find that he could determine the dominant and recessive traits of a plant and how selective breeding could induce a preferred trait. This process would go on to be used to pick the best crops and livestock and pair them to make even better crops and livestock. But more importantly, it gave us more control. With an increasing level of control over cross-pollination for plants and mating for animals, we could make them better suited for our needs. As World War II was ending and wartime scientists studying nuclear applications were looking for ways to continue their work, the Atoms for Peace movement had a sizable sub-movement arise atoms for agriculture. In fact, studies had been happening on this for decades already. As early as the 1920s, experimentation with the effect of x-rays on plant material had shown that they induced changes that could be passed on to future generations in barley. The ionizing radiation they found could cause mutation in the DNA of plants. Many plants would die or get tumors, but a select few could get more useful mutations. The atomic age gave researchers new tools and new forms of ionizing radiation that they used in the hope that an increased rate of random mutations would find some scramblings of the genome that made the plant a stronger, faster growing, and more disease resistant version of its original self. In the Gamma Garden at Brookhaven National Laboratories in Rhode Island, established in 1949, plants and seeds had their genomes rebuilt by being exposed to a cobalt-60 source a totem-like pole in the center of a field planted in concentric circles, with plants ranging from strawberries to sugar maples. By 1958, atomic agriculture had been taken up in government laboratories around the world. The circular spatial form of the Gamma Gardens was simply based upon the need to arrange the plants in concentric circles around the radiation source, which stood like a totem in the center of the field. It was basically a slug of radioactive material within a pole, so the amount of radiation received by the plants naturally varied according to how close they were to the pole. So usually, a single variety would be arranged as a wedge leading away from the pole, so that the effects of a range of radiation levels could be evaluated. Most of the plants close to the pole simply died. A little further away, they would be so genetically altered that they were riddled with tumors and other growth abnormalities. It was generally the rows where the plants looked normal, but still had genetic alterations that were of the most interest. They were just right as far as mutation breeding was concerned. A huge range of plant materials from crops to ornamental plants were tested, including peaches, grapes, blueberries, sugar maples, barley, corn, wheat, violets, and more, all got hit with radiation. By 1962, there were nine induced mutant cultivars, or different varieties of the same plant. In 1969, there were 77, and 1,200 by 1990. As of 2008, more than 2,700 varieties resulting from mutagenic experiments have been released. Some were induced by x-rays, and some were from chemical mutagens, but most were from gamma rays identical to those produced in the gamma gardens of the mid-century. 
To be clear though, this wasn't something that the government wanted to hold tightly to for researchers and big farming operations. There was also a strong, albeit short-lived goal for encouraging atomic entrepreneurship. Yes, for a limited time you could apply to the government for your own radioactive cobalt-60 source, and just keep it in your backyard. One man who did was Clarence J. Spees, an oral surgeon and serial inventor who had previously experimented with seed irradiation using x-rays he would have had easy access to within the dental profession. In 1957, the Atomic Energy Commission approved his request for a radioactive source. He built it into a concrete block bunker on his property in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, near the federal laboratories that had probably sparked his interest in things atomic in the first place, as well as perhaps also the connection through which he obtained his Cobalt 60, and by 1960, he had founded Oak Ridge Atom Industries Incorporated, and was irradiating seeds for sale to the public in packets marked Atom Blasted. CJ was heavily committed to self-publicity, and press accounts seemed to be a bit exaggerated, with claims of 10-foot tall tomato plants that produced more than 200 tomatoes. Although radiation sources could produce larger and more bountiful varieties in plants, it most likely wouldn't be a change this drastic. But as early as the mid-1960s, it had become increasingly clear that the grand dreams of the Atoms for Agriculture movement would not be easily realized. Irradiated super plants had not solved world hunger. For the amateur atomic gardeners, atom blasted seeds hadn't really produced anything interesting in their own backyards. It was way too difficult and dangerous to crowdsource the work on irradiating plants. Individual gardeners likely became impatient with the breeding through successive generations that was required to produce a truly viable mutant. And with seeds that were more likely to not germinate at all than to produce tomatoes of enormous size. Though there were some beneficial products of the movement. The Rio Star grapefruit, which is now very common, is just one example, which was bred in an atomic garden to have very dark flesh and sweet juice. Also, most of the world's mint oil comes from a peppermint cultivar called Todd's Mitchum, which is resistant to certain fungi and was bred at Brookhaven National Lab's Gamma Garden. In fact, there are more than 3,000 registered plants that got to be the way they are because of radiation. At its height, there were many gamma gardens, but most have since fallen to the wayside. Only one country still uses a gamma garden to produce new varieties of plants. Japan. This is because there's more targeted genetic engineering that's made the practice practically obsolete. CRISPR can be used to efficiently target multiple genes in plants and change the expression of other genes. This does the job of atomic gardening without relying on the randomness of the mutations. But that's not to say that radiation isn't used at all in the modern era. Today, radiation is still used in crops, specifically food irradiation. Ionizing radiation is used to kill bacteria, mold, and other pests in food. It can also help slow down the aging of food like fruits and vegetables, which can also allow them to be shipped over longer distances. The FDA has evaluated the safety of irradiated foods for more than 30 years and has found the process to be safe. The World Health Organization, the CDC, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture have also endorsed the safety of irradiated food. It's been used on everything from meats like beef and pork and chicken to fruits and vegetables and various spices. It's important to note that irradiation does not mean it's radioactive. The radiation passes through the food, leaving no lingering traces of radiation behind. That being said, if you want to know if your food has been irradiated, you can look for the Radura symbol that the FDA requires on all all foods that have been irradiated. This is an internationally recognized symbol, so even if you are outside of the United States, you may still find it along with the statement treated with radiation or treated by irradiation on the food label. So while radiation never was able to give us the X-Men level mutations we all wished for as kids, it was able to give us a few thousand new plant varieties. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. As always, thank you for your support and feedback in the comments of each video, and I'll see you in the next one.